What's up, guys? It's time for another Geeks with Wives and Capes. This time it's episode 53. I'm your host, Casey, with my co-host tonight, Will. How's it going, Will? I'm good, man. I'm still recovering from Comic-Con. <laughs> well, stay that. We'll talk about that a little little later. But how, how, else, how else are you doing today? I'm good, buddy. I'm good. It's, it's Thursday. I always look forward to Thursday to talk with you and our esteemed guests. It's always a good day. Speaking of esteemed guests... Uh, we have two great guests tonight. Um, you guys know them from um, the very popular, fantastic Oni Press books, um, Courtney Crumman and Princess Ugg. Ted, is it Naif? Naifi. Naifi and yeah. Warren Wichinich. How's it going? Good. Hey, how, how are you? Guys are you? Doing? Doing, doing well, thanks. So, uh, I'm still recovering from Comic Con. Just, just FYI. <laughs> I know about y'all. We're all in the yeah. same boat then. <laughs> yeah. I'm recovering from just covering Comic Con. <laughs> yeah. Just watching on Twitter in my sad little home by myself. From your little cage. Yeah. Aww. So uh, basically, I want to talk to you guys and and first off, just start out and figure out what's your origin story. How did you guys get together? Um, Where'd the idea for for Princess Ugg come from? Uh, come from? Where? Do you, where? How'd you guys get started in comics? I want to know from the very beginning. Where? What's your story? Why don't oh, we it's a magical individual origin stories, and then we'll do your combined origin story. There you go. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, you first, Warren, Ted. you want to go first? Oh me? Uh, yeah. Okay. You okay. Oh, but this is this is total chaos with all four of us. All right, <laughs> here we go. Um, well, I. Uh, uh, broke into the industry with an explosive slump uh, back in 1991 with a company called Innovation that promptly vanished. They were doing the Vampire Lestat comic book at the time. And uh, I, I was doing a, a book for them, and then like my career kind of slumped, slumped forward for about five years after that, and I got out and went into video games. But um, I, the bug of comics just kept... You know, I just couldn't give it up. I didn't... Couldn't... I loved the art form. I loved, I loved the format, and like... And so a friend of mine had written this little short story called Gloom Cookie, and uh, I illustrated it. Um, and uh, we realized we had something kind of magical, so we took it down to San Diego one year and uh, made ash cans and, and handed them out, and uh, slave labor got a hold of them, and that um, turned into a big classic kind of goth comic. Like It was like a sort of romancy goth comic um, that was really, really popular in the underground goth comic collecting community, if you could believe that there is such a thing, but there oh, was. Yeah, I, I run in those circles, I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, and then after that, I wanted to do uh, something on my own where I write, write and draw, because, you know, honestly, you, you know, when you're doing indie books, you really got to do, you know, you got to do both, uh, or else you really, it's really tough to make a living. So I, um, so I, I started writing, I wanted to write my own project, so I, I pitched uh, Courtney Crumrin, and... Uh, Slave Labor wasn't that interested, but Oni picked it up and really loved it, and it just has been running ever since. Um, I just wrapped up the series uh, last year. Um, I, 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 we launched, I relaunched the series as an ongoing book, and we did that for 10 issues. And that's when Warren came along and was brought on to uh, color the book, because it had originally been black and white. Um, but his colors were so great and so added so much depth and richness to the series that I couldn't, I, it was like there was no decision when it came to the next book that I wanted to do, which was um, Princess Ugg, that there was, there was no decision to be made. He had to be the artist, the colorist on that too. So how do you go about, I mean, choosing a colorist when you live without color for so long? Oh, that's a, that's a, that was a, that was a tough decision. You know, um, I had a couple of samples. Uh, there were like colorists that were, you know, very, um, uh, very workmanlike and straightforward and no nonsense and you know skin tone is skin tone and you know this is dark and this is light and then Warren came along and he was experimental and he was just like I'm just gonna do this in black and white and I'm just gonna do this in all purples and I'm just gonna throw in some yellow here just to make you know, just to make something happen that you didn't expect and I'm like that guy I want that guy very cool so Warren, what what's uh, what's your origin story? Where how did you get started in this whole comic game? Well, well, those are uh, uh, some nice, mighty nice uh, compliments uh, from Ted. There, <laughs> I don't know where to go. Uh, well, um, I actually really didn't get started into comics until about five-ish uh, years ago. 
Um, so I knew a couple of the editors over um, at Oni Press already, and uh, one of them, uh, Jill Beaton, a fantastic editor, one of my dearest friends, uh, suggested that I try to, uh, I guess, uh, learn how to color comics. So um, I picked up a few books and got a Wacom tablet, and I taught myself how to color. Uh, then, um, let's see, I sent in some samples that if you, th um, I did a, let's see, a couple of short, shorts and anthologies uh, for Oni, and then uh, she asked me if I wanted to try out for, let's see, Courtney Crumrin, and I had already read, I think the first four volumes were out, and I'd already read those and thought they were fantastic, and so I thought, sure, I'll give it a shot. And that's and that's basically how I started. So, were you competing for the job against other colorists? Colorists? Um, I think I was. I didn't know at the time. You definitely but. were. You were. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Now you know. <laughs> well, she asked me to audition. That was her. I guess that was the word she used. Audition. So I'm assuming other people uh, were going for it. And then it wasn't until later um, that. Um, that I found out that there were um, several other people, and and of course I was flattered and completely scared to death when I was chosen, but but I just decided to, uh, I guess, go for it with all I have. And and Ted's right, I, I absolutely do um, experiment. I try different things. Um, sometimes, like usually, there's a reason behind it. Sometimes if something isn't working, I'll just try something completely off the wall. And sometimes they stick, sometimes they don't. So, yeah. So, uh, well, when you, when you're auditioning for someone like Ted, who you've obviously read their books and uh, or admire their work, what's your mentality going into that situation? Because I would be freaking out. It's really easy to freak out. It's really easy to get intimidated. But, uh, I mean, usually I go through a couple different drafts. Like, I'll be scared to death for my first draft. And I'll color it, and then I'll look at it, and I'll hate it. And then, um, usually, out of just uh, stress-induced frustration, I'll just do my own version of something. I'll just try to forget the stress, start over, and go at it fresh. And that's usually the stuff I send in. That's usually the stuff that's accepted. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So what were you doing before comics? Me? Um, I worked as a caricaturist on the Las Vegas Strip. <laughs> oh, so you took a step down to work in comic books, huh? <laughs> <laughs> We're all taking a step down. It's grim. How about you, Ted? What were you doing before comics? Um, I was living with mom and dad. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. I was. I was living with mom and dad, and then step two was comic book shop, working in a comic book shop for minimum wage. And then step three was sending in uh, some samples and trying to get work. And, like, I just didn't really do anything else with my life. The only actual day job I ever held down was in video games. For a while I was drawing concepts and doing, you know, 2D and 3D art for video games. Like, I started getting pretty good at doing and making pickups. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not a lot of modeling of complex things, but some simple things. Uh, but uh, it just wasn't... I mean, there's just no glory in video games. There's none at all. Like, even if you... You know, unless you're like... Maybe a handful of people, I think, that get any amount of glory out of video games. Like, oh, you did that model? Cool. No, yeah. nobody cares. You know, <laughs> yeah, like... Unless you're a Cliff Wazinski type, you know, no one knows your name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or an American McGee. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's not... And there's no... There's no path from artist to anywhere glorious in comics, in uh, games. There's, it goes from game tester to producer. Like, you go straight from the bottom, straight to the top. And then the producers get all the glory. Yeah. Um, or, the, you know, sometimes the designers get some glory. But I, honest to goodness, have no idea what that means. Like, what, what is a game designer? I don't know. You know, there's no, seems to be no, like, it's just somebody who says, this would be cool to play. Right. Like there's no education system. There's no, I don't know. Like it seemed it seemed very uh, like a weird. It was a weird uh, industry to be in. It sounds like you're making a commentary on modern games. Do you have something to say about modern gaming, Ted? <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, I'm embarrassed to say it. I really love the la the last Tomb Raider game. 
Okay. Oh, I think a and, lot of us did. So don't be embarrassed. And that really tempted me to play more games, and then I said no, because <laughs> like then I would never get my work done. Yeah. Do you enjoy South Park? Um, I'm not a big fan of South Park. I find it vulgar, but I have a huge amount of respect for those guys. Yeah. Let's say if you're into video games and love South Park, um, that is my, does that, that be sound my game weird? No. 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 Absolutely not. <laughs> It's it's very they're, yeah they have, um, they do a great art. They it's not just I mean, watching Six Days to Air was amazing. Uh, watching them just take a bunch of ideas directly from their posterior regions <laughs> and throw them up on the and like throw a script together real fast and you know do like do the voiceovers real fast and just cobble together the crudest animation imaginable. And in, in Six Days they have a cartoon straight from like. Dumbass ideas to you know there it is like you know poor Cartman being sewn up into a you know human centipede. Um, it was actually Kyle, but close. Was it Kyle? I thought it was Cartman. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was the, See, Kyle's Cartman the would have deserved it. That's so sad. That it was Kyle. I totally missed that. Oh, well, I can't keep track of these characters anymore. But the other brilliant thing about those guys is that they have the that rule that they were talking about when they were talking about creating um, stories, it's these incredibly simple stories, is that there's this very simple rule that they always follow, is that if you're writing a story and you have the words and then in the story, you've failed. Hmm. Stories happen, this thing happens, therefore this thing happens, or this thing happens, but then this thing happens. You can't have and then. If you have and then, you've, you've, lost, you've lost the thread of your story. Your story has just kind of, you're just, it's just a bunch of facts just laying out there. Like stories are a sequence of events. Yeah. You know, and then is just a bunch of facts. And I found that fascinating. And you look at any good movie or comic book or, you know, uh, excellent novel, it's never an and then situation. It's always this happens because that just happened. Um, and this happens, therefore this happens. And this happens, but then, as a conflicting uh, event, this happens. And, that, and they had it, they put it so simply how to like, and that was just the very simple um, expedient of how to write a brilliant little story outline, and I've been following it ever since. So I, I, I mean, like I say, I, I'm not a big fan of the show because it's just, you know, it's so hit and miss, and it's kind of vulgar and not my favorite kind of thing. But I have a huge amount of respect for their craft. If, I think uh, I think you just blew my mind right now, Ted. I don't even know where to go from that. Oh jeez, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was gonna close up the show there. So uh, good night, everybody. That's it. Later. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so on that note, where did the idea for Princess Ugg came, come from, and and how did that kind of uh, formulate? Um, jeez. Well, I was a big. I'd been going to France um, and discovering all these French comic book artists, and this one kind of stood out, Claire Wendling. Uh, and she's like one of those artists, artists that like started off with this great big, ser this fantastic series of f five volume series of uh, that became enormously successful. And then she got so popular as an artist that she just, and she was one of those virtuosos that she kind of stopped doing work, like a lot like Art Adams, where you never see an Art Adams comic book anymore. You just see pinups, then the occasional cover. And the occasional like Godzilla poster, and because he's such a virtuoso that you're never going to really see him just sit down and do the work of doing a uh, a full comic book ever again. He also takes way too long. So Claire, basically every year now, she just releases a magnificently well curated volume of pencil sketches, and they're so amazing that hundreds of thousands of people buy them. Um, and she just has this lovely style that's somewhere between. Uh, um, John John Bluth or Don Bluth, the animator mm -hmm. from the seventies, and um, Frank Frazetta, uh, with a hint of Alphonse Mucha. Um, so there's this. She does these lovely Art Nouveau cursive lines with lots of like barbarian girls writing, you know, perfectly rendered lions and like killing leopards and like you know stuff like, like that and. Um, and fighting, fighting dinosaurs and stuff. And she's all of these monsters and animals and stuff. She's magnificently good at drawing. And I thought, yes, but she doesn't actually tell stories. So what would her story be? Mm -hmm. And then I thought of Princess Ugg. Like, it would be a barbarian princess. That's what I, I want to do, a book that looks like her work. Um, so it would be about 
hmm, a barbarian princess, so what is she doing? Well, of course, she's going to Princess Finishing School. She's going to go and meet all the Disney princesses, and like there will be this comparison, and then and then the whole story kind of fell together from there. Yeah, that I mean, I I love the book so much because I think it's such an not your normal princess story, and your and and, and um, Princess Ugg, as she's called in the book, is not your normal princess, and it's very. Uh, Mind, o- not mind opening. That's such a dumb word. It's very um, refreshing oh, to see you. that kind of story. It, no, it, it really is because I have a two-year-old daughter, so I'm always kind of looking out for things that are not going to place her in a box and say you have to be this, or you have to be that, or you have to be this. And, and in media, in particular, that's very, very hard to do, especially with with the Disney machine constantly turning behind you. Um, and and they have been getting better about kind of separating their princesses and not making them so archetypes. Well, the the same archetype over and over again. Right. That's the real. I find that that's the real problem. But I mean, I I kind of feel like there's a ton of room to just go way past anything that they've dared to do. And what's the point of doing comics if we're not just coming up with crazy ass ideas and just doing them? You know, uh, like what you know, doing the stuff that Disney would never dare do. Like, why do a comic book if it's something that nobody that if it's if it isn't something that nobody else would do? Um, that that the movie industry, that the media industry, that even TV, as brilliant as TV is these days, like there's a lot of stuff that they just are not aren't going to cover, and that's what comic books are for: is doing stuff that nobody else will dare try because it's so cheap, and you can just all you're wasting is your time. Um, and I really like that. I like the freedom in that, and I like the opportunity to just, you know, throw out just like this idea that nobody would know, you know, like that the mov- the movie execs would never dare touch. And then they look at it, finished, fait accompli, and they go, oh, well, that, that could work. And that's cool. That's kind of fun. Yeah. So you all, uh, like with any luck, you end up an outlier, uh, you know, like a, kind of like the vanguard of what's new and fresh. At least that's the fantasy. So how long before Pixar comes knocking? <laughs> well, they're right across the pond from me. I mean, like we gotta, yeah. They're, I know a bunch of people at Pixar, but you know, they're not. They haven't shown up yet. <laughs> we'll see. That's the first thing I, we'll I thought. When I read this book. It's like, man, Pixar is gonna be all over this in two years. Yeah. Because it's it's very much like their like their kind of thing. They're gonna take this idea and then turn turn it on its head. Well, um, they tried to with they tried to do a very similar kind of thing with Brave, but they just didn't go nearly far enough with it. And my understanding well, is that Brave was less a movie than an argument. Well, yeah, and I think that there was there's a lot of behind the scenes issues with Brave, and there was a lot of yeah. creative changes that went along. And I think that's was part of it. I think they were scared to take it down that that warrior path, that darker path, and they went more yeah. for the humor and the classic. Yeah, they made it. I mean. There was some great stuff in it, but like it just—I felt like, boy, there you could take this so much further than they than they dared take it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have a feeling that I mean, if like I'm hoping that you know Princess Ugg goes somewhere, but we'll, you know we'll see. Well, we love it here, and we, like I said, we talk about it all the time and push it. To, I push it to everyone I know that oh, has thank kids you. Um, because I think it's a, it's a fantastic book. And that goes to Warren. Warren, what was your what were your thoughts when Ted brought this idea to you, and how how would you approach it? Um. Well, uh, let's see. Um, first, I asked him, you know, like what sort of, what sort of uh, um, feel um, palettes he would like, uh, that sort of thing, and he gave me, uh, I guess, like some reference material, and we and we talked about that for a little bit. Um, but mostly, I think, um, warmth. Unlike Courtney, which which was pretty, uh, I don't want to say droll, but but it was certainly subdued. It was... It it's was a cold a, book. It's a it is. Chilly, it's very cold. It, it is. It is. It's a chilly, like, late evening book. It's a gloaming book. Right, exactly. Exactly. And, and Princess Ugg, on the other hand, is completely the opposite of that. So so as a colorist, I mean, it was actually very interesting to to work on Courtney, which was such such a cold book, and then... And then work on Princess Ugg, which was a very warm book, but but it's of course it's also drawn by Ted, but the styles are still completely different too, um, and and so yeah, I mean, like really getting warmth and getting sunlight and completely changing up uh, the palette that I was used to um, using, um, it's been incredible fun. I absolutely love coloring this book. 
Um, like, so uh, it's yeah. it's been fun to. I mean, so much like most of the joy of working on this book is seeing the pages, the color pages come in, <laughs> and just seeing like how is he gonna handle this? Oh my god, that's that nailed it. That nailed it. And um, and like for me, like I knew I was really worried about the art on the book until the issue one, the first two issue one color pages came in, and they were the page of you know Olga waking up in her home in the mountains, mm -hmm. and um, Julifer waking up in the in her palace, and they couldn't be more different, and they couldn't be more just rich and like the the scene of. Uh, in the mountain, in the mountain kingdom of Grimeria, mm -hmm. where it's just all icy blues and gray and soft gray white snow, and then this hint of just a tiny touch of pink and gold in the sky, just the barest, like just whispered pink over over the sky a little bit, just here and there, and it just came alive. And I'm like, that's it. And then the contrast between the two just made me want to cry. They were so gorgeous. Um, <laughs> And then, and that just set the tone, and I knew like that he's got it. He's just nailed this thing. Like he, like he's, like just the rich, the rich, rain, soft, delicate rainbows of color that he put in there just <laughs> knocked my socks off. Now that being, yeah, I'm going. Go ahead. No, sorry. Go uh, ahead. <laughs> say, as a guy who primarily worked alone uh, for most for most of your career, is it a huge weight off your shoulders when uh, when Warren turns in pages like that and you just kind of kind of breathe a sigh of relief? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Like there's just I can't even tell you just how relieving it is to like have like I mean you you I mean you, you don't know when you spend like your whole life struggling to do decent work um, to just kind of have like your work you turn in your work and it's and you know there's a long way to go for for print and then. A day later, or a couple of days later, it comes back and it's done. Like I can't even tell you how incredibly gratifying it is. Like, and it's it's done and it's ten times as good as it was. You know, it's like this that suddenly like it's not just that he colors; it's that he knows exactly which lines of mine to select and push back and like make like it's so because it's I mean I deliver a black and white work and he selects some of the lines and he turns them, you know, he lightens them up and so that it creates. A huge extra layer of composition on the page, and then and not only that, but he's also I mean he was doing this like crazy in the Courtney book. He's telling the story with the color in the Courtney book. The first time I realized this guy was telling stories with color was when the um, the goblin first appears in issue in chapter one, and the whole scene sort of turns purple uh, uh, because yeah. the the presence of fairy yeah. magic. Remember that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. What, uh. what was uh, what what was that? Where did that come from in your head? Uh, well, unfortunately, with uh, I guess with Courtney Crummer, I had the advantage of already being familiar with the story. I mean, it had mm -hmm. been out for four entire volumes. I mean, that's yeah, yeah. literally hundreds of pages that I get to mm -hmm. pour over. And since I was, I guess, like, since I had that, I was able to go through and kind of systematically choose my palettes for each scene for for literally a few hundred pages yeah, and nice. um, it, and so yeah I mean I decided pretty early on like the goblin town and in most of like that fairy sort of magic was going to be purple yeah so uh, so like when it shows up I, mean, I even forget like which technically which issue it is like if it's the first or second one like when it shows up yeah I mean it shifts to that for just Two pages, but then it goes back again. But then you see all the purple in Goblin Town, sort of thing. Yeah, but, yeah. The Goblin Town was like made of purple, and then when they got to the um, yeah. the the auction block, it was green. And right, but that right, green right. was this that green was this incredibly non like it was a dark, creepy fairy green. It was like not yeah, a green yeah. that exists in nature. Right. And so it was just perfect. I mean, it created this wonderful, terrifyingly creepy world. And what it reminded me of is actually I was saw this documentary on the making of. Um, the sixth sense, and one of the rules in the sixth sense is that the hey. color red indicated that ghosts were coming. Um, and oh. every time you see red, like there's a bright red balloon, and it leads to the top of this house, and the kid walk, climbs to the top of the house, and he gets locked into this little chamber where, like, a ghost was in there, and he had been trapped and trapped and starved to death by his master, like 500 years or like 100 and something years ago, and and this ghost was still in there, and the kid like was locked in there with the ghost. And like the color red, 
led you to that moment. Every time you saw red, mm. you knew ghosts were coming. Like that was the that was the little trick. That was the um, that was the visual cue. And like, and he talks really excessively about like whenever he's creating a conversation, something red is in the scene, and he doesn't want it there. He's like, get it out, get it out. Um, and that's how kind of what ends up happening is every time we touch on a little bit of fairy magic in Courtney, Warren slips a little bit of purple in there. And it was like, yeah, that's it. That's perfect. I mean, that, and that like sets the whole flavor of the, of the, of the book. Like from Warren, beginning to end, six volumes of that. Yeah, I'm actually reading volume six right now and really enjoying it and, 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 and understand exactly what you're saying about Warren's coloring. And I actually have a question for Warren about the techniques of coloring and a new trend I kind of see developing in something you use in Courtney Kremen when you drew the uh, or the colored the, the the fruit that he eats that one of the kids eat in the very beginning. The, okay, the, yeah. The goblin. How how the hell do you guys make it look like pages are glowing? <laughs> that that um, um that's mostly called a color hold. And what that is, it's where you are actually coloring, I guess, in a sense, on top of the black line uh, yeah. of the inks. You're coloring on top of that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you add a little bit of, of color fuzz, a little bit of light, if you will, uh, and it gives it a glow, yeah. It crushed it. Yeah, that I know exactly what scene you're talking about and like, and you do the, that's what that's color holds. I was trying to talk about that, but I forgot that that was the term for it. And, uh, and you do that with so well, and like you know exactly oh, nice. when to do it and where to do it, and that's, and yeah, the pages end up looking like they're glowing. It's, it's absurd. Well, yeah, What's it's up with that? It's a wonderful technique, and it, it seems to be a growing trend in comic books, and I, and I love it when I see it because, yeah, it does stand out, and it just brings a page to life, and it's so beautiful to look at. It's like staring at the sun. Yeah. <laughs> Well, hopefully uh, my colors don't blind you like the sun will. But <laughs> hey, that's a good reputation. Hang your hat on, my friend. My colors are so good they blind people. Yeah. How do you like that? Uh. <laughs> so, guys, I have a question. Pr uh, Pr Princess Olga, she's uh, she definitely has a very uh, a very unique personality, a very unique look to her. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody in your life that helped inspire the overall character? Of, of Princess Olga herself. Oh, for me? Yeah. I was, I mean, I was dating a savage for about <laughs> five years. Uh, and uh, she didn't shave her armpits and, like, she didn't trim her, her eyebrows and, you know, and, and it's like, yeah, that's Olga. That's, did, yeah, did that's you, the did archetype. Did bad things when, when you guys ate dinner, too? <laughs> Occasionally, yeah. Yeah, she's been known to do that. She was a she was a yeah she's a bit of a beast she'd be the first to tell you. <laughs> hey, so that uh, uh, that was inspiring. That's awesome. <laughs> what uh, what what kind of what kind of things were you into growing up? You know, were you into comics? Were you into collecting anything? Like what what kind of what kind of things I guess kind of inspired you creatively in your younger days? Uh, well, I grew up in the early '80s, so I was looking at heavy metal magazine and all the French guys. Right. Like Moebius and um, yeah, Drier was like this dude that would do comics where like huge double page spreads of whole marching armies riding great big crazy beasts and it was like super psychedelic and all that kind of thing. How about you, Warren? Me? Um, mostly, I grew up in the early 80s as well and um, a lot of my inspiration probably comes uh, from Masters of the Universe and Voltron and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So we just had really? Jeff Wadlow on uh, a couple weeks ago talking about Masters of the Universe and his uh, his involvement in that movie. I oh, listened man. to that one. Yeah, yeah. Listen to that one. <laughs> so, Wait, no, you're not a fan, Ted. You're not a fan. <laughs> I, you know, I I have a I have a quibble with Masters of the Universe, and that's it. So apparently, my understanding is that it was originally Conan. They were developing a Conan cartoon, and then they lost the license to Conan, so they decided to replace. Uh, the name Conan with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> like I know, instead of like take like now that we've had to take off all the Conan trademarks off of this thing, we will just leave them blank. <laughs> you know, like I mean, what it, it's literally a series of placeholder names. You know, like Skeletor. Really? How? Do, why is his name Skeletor? Can you tell me that? You know, like come on, like. 
Why does, like, let me ask you a question. Why the hell does He-Man have an alternate identity? <laughs> like, why, why any of that, why any of that show? Yeah, you know, that just, the, I, the I, 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 I'm so angry at that show, and I have been <laughs> since I was maybe 12 years old. So, so I'm just guessing you're like, not a fan. The, the anger has not subsided. It's, yeah. just, it's not subsided man, at all. Just He Man. <laughs> yeah. Same man Man. His name is Man Man. Yeah. yeah pretty much. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm a big fan of Man Man, so I'm sorry. <laughs> God help you. I'm so sorry. What is it? Tell me. Explain to me. I, you know, Warren, tell me why, 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 what. I, well, if you run well, around on a you green know, I mean, lion cat, you know, he's got a cool sword. Well. Maybe it was the after school or the afternoon shows. All thing of that because, was done uh, better by Thundar. Yeah, you know. <laughs> well, Thundar was fine, but but yeah. but maybe it was just getting home from school and I've got He Man followed by Voltron. I've got my sci-fi and I've got my fantasy. Sometimes Inspector Gadget would be on, so if I could mm -hmm. get like, yeah. I guess I guess my science nerd thing going on. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. One after one, really fantastic. <laughs> all right. It was all yeah, about the I, I mean, I was actually, I was more of a Robotite guy myself. No. Oh, that show made no sense to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it it does make no sense, and I'll tell you why. I found this out. <laughs> Turns out the guy who brought it to America doesn't speak Japanese and had no translation, so he was literally making up the dialogue. You know, like. <laughs> It looks like they're saying this, so let's just have him say this. Like, he had no idea what was actually happening in the series. Didn't uh, care. I just wrote dialogue to, to fit the, the way the mouths moved. Yeah. That was it. That was the show. And oh, that's why that's it made great. literally no sense. Like, zero sense. <laughs> I was a huge Mask fan. Mask. Oh, Mask. Mask is mask. great. But only mask, because my uh, parents... That's the only to toys my parents could afford to buy me. <laughs> Well, mask the 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 mask from Dark Horse? Uh, no, they had no, no, no. they had like, they had, like, like, like vehicles mask. that would turn into something different. Yeah, they were like, flying DeLorean and stuff. Yeah. It was uh, yeah. yeah. What, what, did, what did it stand for, kids? It was like mobile assault. I don't know. Company. It was dumb as hell. <laughs> I have no memory of this. Command. I had Micronauts. It was terrible. Okay. Oh, I remember. Yeah, I remember Micronauts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were cool. I loved Micronauts. Big so, fan. So back to Princess. Uh, um, Sorry. <laughs> oh no, no problem. That conversational podcast. Well, we can go off tangents. No, no yeah. worries. Um, <laughs> so what? What's the age target for this book? Because when I when I read the first issue, I was like, oh, this would be a good book for my young young daughter when she's when she's starting to read. And then I got to issue two, and I was like, oh, maybe not so much. Maybe not until she's a teenager or so. It's, right, because it's, you guys, it's a teenage book. I think of it as a teenage book. You know, I think tweens can read it and will get it. Uh, but it's also about it's about high school, right? Because you I was gonna say you deal with some very like uh, straight up high school issues like body, um, body image and, and, mm -hmm. and personality and and having to deal with other people that aren't like you and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's so all high school all that, stuff. Yeah, all that intentional. That was the, the whole point of oh, the, yeah. the, oh, the yeah. book. Well, I mean the the shower scene, like I kind of lifted that from uh, straight out of. Um, 16 Candles. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, you know, and I thought, you know, this would be funny. You know, like, uh, what would an ordinary princess think looking at, like, a barbarian princess in the shower? You know, and, of course, that's, gonna ha that's a thing that happens. You know, kids look at other kids, and they judge, and they, you know, and they, they like, you know, they get self-conscious and, all, like, all that stuff. And they, and also, and they, they kind of go tribal. They separate, uh, you know, they separate people according to their bodies and the like you know and their you know their tastes and their all all that stuff and that's kind of part of you know kind of the horrible things that happen to kids when they when they go to high school and like all the horrible things that they do to one another yeah. you know and i and so i thought you know like why not deal with it honestly and it you know like in an innocent way it's kind of you know cute and a little titillating and funny and and I, I mainly thought it was funny for them to like look at like Muscle Lady and go, ah, you know, what the hell is that? Um, I mainly played it for laughs, but I really it it seemed like an important scene, and I was very excited to have in there. And like, of course, that's the scene that gets everybody, um, 
like I think it's gotten reviewers up in arms, and and I'm pretty, you know, I'm not at all unhappy about that. I well, I, 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 yeah, I was gonna say, I'll admit when we read it, I was kind of like taken back. I was like, whoa, this book tur- took a hard <laughs> right turn, <laughs> really, uh, <laughs> real, real fast. And then, but then after I read it the second time, I kind of I I realized it was for it was played for laughs, and it's not, and it is like a, it's a body image issue, like it, they're yeah. They're understanding each other's bodies, and they're they're growing up, and they're realizing this mm-hmm. is a different person. But that's why I asked about the age thing because, like I said, when I read the first issue, I was like, "Oh, this would be a good book for a little someone. kid." Yeah, yeah, a little kid. And then the second issue was like, "Oh, maybe uh, not so much." Uh, well, I mean, um, I'm I'm, I'm going to warn you. At some point in the series, Olga is going to like be chopping people to bits. Like that's not going to not happen in the book. <laughs> you know, it's got to happen because she's going to she's going to be carrying that axe around. For you know, eight straight issues at some get point. Used for something, right? You, you know, it, somebody's yeah. gonna. It's gonna chop some heads. You know, yeah. I'm just warning you now. Like it's not, like it's, and, and I'm not gonna. You know, I'm not gonna hide the chopping heads or, and the flying limbs. You know, um, uh, I'm surprised it's taking this long. <laughs> well, August you know, there was there was a beheading in issue two, but it was only a fantasy beheading. Right. <laughs> Love that. Um. So Warren, uh, last question until we move on to the comic books. What what different techniques are you ap- applying to Princess Ugg that you haven't used before? Oh wow, um, I'm using um, I guess a lot of this is sort of technical. I don't know if it makes a lot of sense to um, folks that they really don't know Photoshop too well. But um, I use a lot of different types of gradients, um, and for this one, I'm using a different. Uh, I guess a few different types to get a good uh, sunlight feel, to make things feel like they glow in the sun, to give uh, certain things like a transparency, um, which of course I never used in Courtney. I think the sun only came out twice in that entire series. <laughs> so I've been reading it for a little so. while. I don't think I've even seen the sun. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. The sun really so, is a figure in big in the Courtney books. Yeah. <laughs> but um, like Ugg is. It's very different. Yeah, I mean, I'm using different gradients. I'm using different um, brushes entirely. But then again, it is still Ted's style. I mean, it's Ted's artwork. It's still his style. So, so some things I still keep um, from Courtney to this. But um, this one, for the most part, has new gradients, new textures. It takes a bit longer, but but it's so fun doing this book. This book is it's an absolute blast to do. And uh, but but yeah, I mean, mostly just just trying to replicate. Frankly, sunlight has been my big thing on this one. Mm-hmm. What was I mean? Let me tell. I'm gonna tell you my favorite page. And I'm gonna ask you what your favorite page was to to, to color because I the, the page that really co- like drew me into the book um, initially was when she first entered um, the lower level t- town. Uh, excuse my, I can't think. I forget the name of it, but the Atresca. The Atresca, thank you. Where she first enters Atresca, and she and you had that big splash page of the the image of the town and all the um, the the houses and the buildings, and she's on her mount and and walking through the town. This huge page, and yeah, I think even your editor uh, Jill commented. Um, that's her name, right, Jill? Yeah. Jill, yeah. Jill was the she, yeah yeah yeah. She's the first editor, yeah. And, and I think, uh, oh, maybe it was the second editor, who's, who's, whoever's editing the book now, who replaced Jill. Did she oh, who wrote the, the? Oh, yeah, she she wrote the afterward. So there that's, you go, thank that's you. Robin. Okay. That's Robin. Right, right. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right, Robin. She, I think she even commented about that page and just how gorgeous it was and how like how much it, it kind of expl- you, like you said, Ted tells a story about the world and the place and the differences between uh, between um, Olga's world and and the one she's in now. I just really yeah. love that page. It's a f- that page drives me crazy. <laughs> I, I would say I, I, that must have taken you a, quite a while to get to get right because it's, there's so much detail and there's so much background. And well, I, it, I really it, have to commend you, Ted. Thank on you. Your- <laughs> thank you. <laughs> because I think um, a lot of artists, especially in the Marvel and the DCs, just do not take the time to do backgrounds like you do, and your backgrounds oh. are amazing. Well, thank you. I uh, would have. I wish I had taken the time to actually grid it out so that, like, I mean, Warren probably noticed this that, like, uh, oh yeah, you know, everything is on the right <laughs> plane because the plane, the you know, the the plane as people stand and like get smaller in the background and larger as they get closer is just all wrong. Uh, <laughs> and believe me, that book or that page is much better than the double page spread that it replaced because I had drawn it. I had to draw the whole thing twice because yeah. I did it the first time. Uh-huh. 
and it just sucked. It just sucked. It sucked. And so I'm like, I can't release a book looking like this. And like, and so I did it again, and it was much better, but it was still like I got to the end, and I'm just like, oh my god, did, did I draw that? Because like, if you look at like, you know, like by the time you get from one side of the street to the other, like the ground level has just distorted dramatically, and um, characters that are actually much closer in the foreground are much smaller than characters further up in the background, and, you know, Olga looks like a giant, and it's just wrong. And, like, I even had to select her and make her much smaller before I sent it over, and it's still, like, a goddamn disaster. But, uh, you know, of course, everybody loves the page, so I must have done something right. Yeah. <laughs> she was also in the center of the original one, wasn't she? She was like in the middle of the page crease, right? Dead. Yeah, that was the other reason I just couldn't go with that page because right. she was dead set in the middle. And uh, I mean, there were so many problems with that book. Like, there's a chapter break, or there's a chapter page in in the entire book. You know, in the in the after the first uh, introductory pages that I put in because the double page spread landed. <laughs> You know, on a you know, like in the wrong place, and you can't you can't have a double page spread on two pages that are like back to back. You have to have them facing each other, you know, because otherwise it's not a double page spread. It's two pages. But yeah, there were just so many things, so many dumbass things I did wrong in that book. Like I don't know what such I was a, thinking, but such a fun like, book that it was it was so fun to work on. It really. So I I had a lot of fun too. It's a great book. I, like I said, I recommend it to everybody I know because I think it's such an in, a great entry level book. If you don't read comics, it's just a great book. If you're a fan of like the the princess genre, it's a really uh, fun turn um, in, in that genre, and I just think it's, it's appealing to a mass audience. And I really, really hope it catches on and it becomes a giant thing because I just think you have something magical on your hands. Well, thank you so much. Definitely. Okay, one last question, and then we'll move into comics because we only got about 15 minutes left. Uh, did you, are you a fan of Fable, the video game? Fable the game? No, I've yeah. never played it. Okay, because I you you call it you call it, you make reference to an Albion, which is the oh. name of the, of the town in Fable. So oh, that's just, an old I, word. That's an okay. old word. I can't even remember <laughs> what I'm specific. <laughs> I just thought you know I just you know I wanted to have swear words and you know and so I made up some swear words. You know, like you know, that was what in God's name, but you can't say what in God's name in a fantasy world because, like, that's that makes it boring. Yeah. Um, right. You know, so that was her. What's in, what in God's name? And like, and I, you know, like the the Gothic princess says, "Great Yog," instead of "Good God," and uh, and I think you know, I'm sure Olga has something that I can't remember offhand. Like, yeah, like I said, I thought I I could have sworn those were references, but nope, totally wrong. All right. No, nope, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what uh, what are you guys reading lately, Ted? What, what's what's in your poll list, or what are you reading? What's on your desk that you've been reading I, for? I, I just recently, you know, I'm always behind. So, I like my the latest thing I've read was the two Hawkeye books and Saga. Uh, yeah, really obvious. Fantastic. Fantastic. Like the first two books. Hawkeye trades and and this Saga book. Yeah. I you know and like yeah I mean like the Hawkeye is basically you know the Rockford Files for superheroes. It's kind of fun. <laughs> That pizza dog issue is some amazing. The, like, the pizza stuff. dog issue is the best. Yeah. It's yeah. I really wish more comics would take layout layout like risks like that issue does. That is, those layouts mm -hmm. in that comic book are just unseen anywhere else. It's the only place yeah. you're going to see layouts like that. Well, that's. I mean, it's brilliant. Like so he's, you know, he, he's, you know, they're reinventing. They're reinventing the format, which is kind of part of the fun. Uh, I'm, of course, I'm not. I, you know, I always look at it with like a certain amount of like, God damn it, I'm not really that experimental. Should I be doing that? Should I be doing this? Should I? Yeah, it's, I can't. I can't uh, that's got to be hard being a being a comic creator, writer, artist, and reading other comics and having that issue. Does it happen a lot? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Warren, does it happen a lot? <laughs> it happens quite a bit. It happens quite yeah. a bit. Like there's certain books I just can't read anymore because. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and so, Saga is like I mean I like it makes me want to do sci-fi, you know. That book's amazing. That's, that 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 I guarantee that's gonna be a HBO show, real oh, soon yeah, here. Yeah. It's the How most good inspiring enough? book I've read in ages. So, so good. good. That being said, you know I don't know how they're gonna pull off ninety percent of it. Like I mean they can't make it an HBO show because how the heck? I mean unless they make it basically a all CGI all the time, and then it's gonna look terrible. Like how could they? Look it's just the, yeah. yeah. Well, like how are they going to pull off the lion cat? You know, how are they going to pull off right, like all right. the 
all the makeup effects. Like they can't like you can't just put people in horns all day and have it like not look like bad Buffy. You know, <laughs> like even right. even Buffy. I mean, the the makeup effect, the characters that were always in makeup. Like I think after a while, like like in Angel, they had a character that was just green, and that was his look. Oh, Lauren, yeah, yeah, Lauren, yeah. And he was just you know, and like, and they had to put him in the makeup chair. But it was the cheapest, fakest makeup you can imagine, and like, you know, he was funny for comic relief, but that can't be a main character. I don't know that they could pull it off. I mean, yeah, but you then you know, like it's that just means it's a challenge, and if they do pull it off. Then you know I'll eat every word I said. And I'm happy to do it. Yeah, it's such a big epic story. I just don't think you could fit it in a in a movie. It, oh, maybe no, there, would, movies. there would be it would be stupid to do so. Right, but uh, well, I guess Daniel Ratcliffe's new movie with by Joe Hill, Horns. Mm-hmm. It should be a good indication of how that that kind of effect will look and how what it would be like to have a character that's kind mm-hmm. of like that style on on screen for cause that that looks like a fantastic film and and the mm-hmm. book is. What I, from what I hear, is really great too. So, mm-hmm. hopefully, more of that stuff get, kind of gets adapted. And I'm really excited that comic books have become so popular that we're getting to see these amazing movies and and live action things we've never would have seen ten years ago. No way in hell. Well, it's it's actually a little bit like I don't know. It's a little bit sad because like if I was a yeah. uh, 15 again, I would have been over the moon about you know like I mean I and don't get me wrong, I was over the moon about the Dark Knight when it came out. I was over the moon about it. But, you know, like now I kind of found myself going, and I'm thinking that this is probably what a lot of the teen generation is probably thinking is, well, that's cool. How come they're not making the good comic books into movies? You know, like like Saga and like Hawkeye. And like, what well, we're never going to see a Hawkeye Black Widow movie. You know, like then that that's what we should be seeing. You know, like Never that's, say never, I'm, my friend. <laughs> well, you know, I would like to see them do like the daring material. Um... And so, like, it, to me, like, doing an adaptation, a movie adaptation of a comic book from the 70s in you know, Avengers is not daring. It's, it's, they think it's daring because it's never been done in the movies before, but that's, like, I mean, that's, they're 30, 40 years out of date at this point. Like, stuff that, stuff that was old hat 40 years ago is now only just making it to the movies. And, like, and so, you know, I'm kind of, you know, like, and, and you know, that's just the way it is with movies. That's how it is when you're playing to Peoria, as it were. Um, well, Will and I will be going to see uh, Guardians of the Galaxy tonight, and that movie mm-hmm. is pretty pretty daring. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see how daring it is. <laughs> we'll see. Well, wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. How daring is it? Like, what is, why is it daring? It's it's daring. Well, number one, it's daring because, I mean, t- the two best characters in Guardians of the Galaxy, in my opinion, and most people's opinion who read that book, are a tree who says three words mm-hmm. and, a, and a psychotic raccoon who is a complete a-hole. Um, and when, when those okay. two are your... When those two are your stars, and then you're jumping around from planet to planet, and then they're them kind of being like, not anti-heroes, but like the fumbling, like not like we're kind of just doing this to do this. And we're not really like good at it. We're just mm-hmm. we want to do right, the right thing. It just works so well, and there's there's such a, like an oddball team, uh, mm-hmm. when, when especially in the comic books, they're just so weird and so out there, and the things they do, and the and their and their interactions between each other. And Peter Quill is very much like the new Han Solo, if if you will, and. And then the way he interacts and kind of leads this team, this of this ragtag team, it's very, it's a lot, a lot of, it's fun. It's just a ton of fun, um, and it has a lot of heart behind it. Like I said, um, I guarantee you, there's going to be a scene in the movie where the tree and the raccoon are going to make you cry, um, and the, and it happens more mm-hmm. than once in, in the comic book. There, there's a particular moment in it, and it's and it's it, they repeat it over and over again, but every single time it gets you because okay. they have such a bond together and because they're such friends and they. And they're not like the Avengers, where they just kind of like come together for these moments. They're always together. They're a family. They they live mm-hmm. together. They fly together. They do these things together. They they go out of their way to help each other when they don't have to. And and that's why the Guardians of the Galaxy is so special to me because, like I said, it's that space family that I always wanted to be. I wanted to be Peter Quill. I wanted to be abducted when I was ten and live in mm-hmm. space and make friends with a talking raccoon. Like that was my it's dream. A, it's a pretty good premise. I mean, just like the kid getting abducted at age ten and he becomes like a space adventurer. That's a that's a pretty good premise. But it's not. Tremendously groundbreaking, like post Star Wars. You know, that's all I'm saying. I mean, I, I don't mean to bag on it, and I'm sure it's going to be a great film, and I'm going to go out and see it. But uh, like, I want to like, you know, I don't. I I'm not. I'm not blown away by its by the. I don't. I feel like there's a lot of hype around it. It's being groundbreaking just because there happens to be a talking raccoon in it. And like, I saw Chewbacca. You know, I don't. I don't see a huge difference between the the raccoon and Chewbacca. Like, you know, if right. 
you know, like if Chewbacca was existed now, he'd be all CGI, and like, and that that would be awesome. Yeah. But and I and don't get me wrong, I love the original Star Wars. Like, I'm not a huge fan of the series, but I love the original film, and yeah. because it was so damn groundbreaking and so like out of left field, and like, but I don't necessarily I I'll have to see how groundbreaking uh, Guardians of the Galaxy is to believe it. Um, and like, and again, this gets back to the idea that like when I'm looking for groundbreaking stuff, I don't look at the movies. I look at Comics and TV. Right. Um, TV is breaking ground with like Orange is the New Black and like Breaking Bad and all those like the antihero films and like, and comics are breaking ground with like you know Hawkeye and, and Saga and, and just about everything. Yeah. You know, like there's so much stuff that comics get to do that nobody else gets to do. Yeah. Yeah. Recently, Superior Spider-Man was my favorite story, and that just is, is completely insane premise and storyline for that for mm. a Marvel to pull off. To literally kill off your most popular character and make the villain the, the hero, um, <laughs> and in an insane manner, um, mm-hmm. it was amazing. I loved it every second of it. So yeah, I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah, I like Warren, seeing that. I like seeing the daring. Sorry, go ahead. No, Warren, what what are you reading lately? Oh jeez, um, I am actually so so far behind. I mean. <laughs> uh, We're creators. We don't have time to read yeah, this stuff. Yeah, that's exactly like it's really funny. It's. It, I had so much time to read comics, but now that I'm making comics, I really don't have a lot of time. Like, I love Saga, I love Hawkeye and Daredevil, like, it's some of my favorite books, but but I have literally seven months of Saga to catch up on. Yeah. In my box, like, I have three short boxes of books that I've bought that I haven't actually read yet. And, and so, like, when I find a few extra minutes, I sit down and read one. But, uh, but yeah, like, Saga's fantastic. Like I said... Um, Daredevil is, it's great. It's absolutely great. So, so <laughs> I wish I could give you something more, uh, more recent, but, but I think the, the most oh, recent no, thing I read was a Bendis X-Men from like two months ago. Oh, geez, and that yeah. was about it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading I Was the Cat, but it's an Oni Press book. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Which, it's fantastic. I mean, and it's, it's making me angry because I had a cat book. <laughs> and I didn't, you know, and I don't know if they want to do anything with a cat book now. I don't know if, like, if, like, now cats are going to be it or if now cats are going to be, like, no, you can't do cats. It's been done. Yeah, they already did. I think we're too late on the cat thing, man. I think we're too yeah, late. Yeah, we already, yeah, we blew it. We blew it. Like, I had a cat book. Damn it. <laughs> Quick plug, we have a review at geeksandwives.com now. So check that out. <laughs> that, should, um, that should be your next book. I had a cat book. <laughs> yeah, I had a cat book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, also, I, I need to catch up on um, um, Helheim, which oh, was again, yeah. you know, like again, this, this is what it is to be a creator. You know, like about fifteen, twenty years ago, I had a book with a guy who had this idea about it was like the Seven Samurai story, but they all got killed, and some witch sews their bodies together into one big beautiful being and sends it off to the bat to, like, take revenge for, you know, eviscerating the town. And um, and uh, now we've got Helheim, which is basically that premise. Hmm. Um, and I'm like, well, and, you know, could, I mean, I, you know, I had my chance with that one. It never got finished. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, and so it's funny, but, but now I'm dying to see the end of Helheim because I haven't gotten, I haven't gotten all the way through it yet. But that's a very promising book, too. Yeah. Well, I'm going to add a couple more books to your poll list uh, because the books that I'm reading have been fantastic. Um, you tell. The, the first one is from Dark Horse. It just came out this week. D- D- it's called Deep Gravity. Deep Gravity. Hmm. It's basically... Okay. Uh, it's basically... I, I, don't wanna, I hate to call it Avatar, but it is, it's kind of Avatar without the Avatars. Uh-huh. Um, oh, okay. Well, so, yeah. so basically... It, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So basically, the, like, uh, Earth has found a planet that's that's inhabitable in some form. Like we, uh, the human beings can only last there for three years. After that point, you start to die very quickly. Um, but they found that it's it's rich in natural resources. Mm. So um, to get to this planet, it takes three years just to get there. So the so uh, corporations have to buy, like make a bid for it because not everyone they're not going to have just a corporate war to go over and get the stuff. So everyone's the, the major corporation. Like makes a bid for the for the planet, if you will, to mine it, and then um, basically just see, they send teams of scientists over there every three years and to kind of replace itself. So the the entry book is kind of just introducing that that premise and then introducing you to the world um, 
that they they that they are now kind of stuck on for three years and having to deal with all this these these uh these challenges of of being in space and the, the effects it has on your body and the effects it has on your relationships when you're gone when you're gone at six years at a time and you're you're away from your family and your friends and you're and you have to chase people across the galaxy when you really love them um, and it's 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 a very cool premise I really like the kind of uh, I really I'm a huge space guy, so anything that has to deal with space and sci-fi, I just automatically gravitate to. Another book, Letter 44 from Oni, has been fantastic uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, it's very much kind of the same thing. It's like there's this planet out there, we're discovering it, and and what happens when when Earth like has access to to these new resources and these new ideas and and space travel and all that kind of thing, and then what happens when corporations are involved and 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 all these people have to deal with all these. New challenges in in the world. And it's it's a very cool idea, and I love the realism. It, it's yeah, based I, off. it's very very real to me. I have a copy of that one. I've been like, that's just sitting there waiting to get read. But you know, like <laughs> yeah. Warren said, when do we have time to sit down and right. read a whole graphic right. novel? <laughs> yeah, but that one's yeah, that one's sitting there. It's waiting, and like, it's good to know that it's being recommended. Uh, another one I I'd like like you guys. To, I mean, if you're if you're into Rick Remender, you guys know who Rick Remender is, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I met a few times. Yeah, I call, yeah, I call him the the bad news bear because no book ends in a happy ending. Um, <laughs> he has he has two books uh, out right now: uh, Black Science, which is on issue seven, and which is I always describe it. I've said it a million times on this podcast. It's ass, it's sliders with that show with what's his name? Uh, Will help me out here. Sliders. Yeah. That was Jeremy O'Connell, wasn't it? Yeah, O'Connell. The guy who they like jump from dimension to dimension. Yeah. Jerry O'Connell. Yeah. yeah. Timer. Yeah. It's that, but on acid. <laughs> okay. So, and what's so the name of this book? It's called Black Science. Uh huh. So it's basically about a family who gets t- stuck in a dimensional like loop where they're just hopping from dimension to dimension to dimension, and it and it and in true Rick Remender fashion, it takes huge twists and turns, takes massive risks, kills off a major. Like it's Game of Thrones style killings uh, of characters uh, uh, you just wouldn't expect. Yeah, so it's very, very cool. And like I said, no happy ending. So don't expect any like uh, anything great from it. Well, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then and then Low, which came out this week, is uh, another um, Rick Remender book, and it's basically about a about Earth has now descended to the depths of the ocean mm-hmm. because the sun is consuming the planet. Um, so the, the way to escape, but they escape is they go, basically go down to the to the bottom of the ocean and then. It just kind of starts from there, so I don't really know what's happening. They they're at the mm-hmm. bottom of the ocean. They're they're super just living advanced. underwater. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they've lived there for tens of thousands of years, and they have like there's like pirates or marauders or raiders on that they don't get along with, and they're now they're kind of battling. And there's this, like this cool mech suit that's very like uh, Bioshock inspired. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it just the artwork is amazing. Uh, Warren as a colorist, I think you really just enjoy okay. the, the way they use color and the way they use light mm-hmm. and. And darkness, awesome. because like I said, you're at the bottom of the ocean, so it's really dark a lot of the time. Yeah. Really, and and like Rick Remender is really good at picking artists and just they have very a very unique um, sure. style, and uh, and it's and both Black Science and Low have just very unique art styles. They're fantastic. Mm-hmm. Will, cool. you want to talk I'll, about I'll your check books? it all out. Yeah. Um, I, I I'm gonna go through it real quick since it's already 8:30. Uh, yeah. We, okay. I read Harley Quinn. Uh, you all know how I feel about Harley Quinn. I love Harley Quinn. This book is always fun, zany, crazy. <laughs> um, this this was definitely kind of a uh, more of a one-off issue where we're not really getting anything, and you know that's part of the major story. It's more of kind of like a day in the life of Harley Quinn. So you've got her at a roller derby bout, and you know dealing with her issue with you know because she adopted like a horde of dogs and what to do with all the waste from the dogs. So um, there's a very crazy way that they came up with to get rid of that. Uh, we'll just say it's a giant poop fleeing catapult. <laughs> uh, but other than that, um, I'm going to drop a major spoiler. At the end of this book, we see a very dark and sinister character who could be infatuated with Harley watching her from binoculars afar. So I'm sure we're going to get to find out who this guy is. And it's Two-Face. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, check out like, Harley Quinn. As always, the artwork is 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 crazy. The uh, you know Harley herself is crazy and fun. So yeah, check it out. That was all I read this week. All right. Oh, uh, so you didn't read Rebel Heist? No, not yet. Okay, I have a question for you because it, it it messes up my Star Wars continuity, and I'm really upset about it. Okay. Um, so I'll I'll save it for next week and until after you read it because we finally kind of figure out where it lies in the timeline, and I don't. It, 
It happens after episode th- uh, episode whoa, four. Shit. Episode four. Yeah. So it's between episode four and episode five, okay. which doesn't mesh with me very well because I don't feel like the, they would be those types of characters at that time period. That soon. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. It's you it's good. It it's okay. Between more five and six, maybe. I well, I thought it. I, and this is sorry, Warren and Ted. This is totally off. <laughs> no, I'm, I thought it was, I'm just listening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I thought it was. I thought it was. Uh, I thought it took place after okay. those movies, and it was like them kind of like after uh, episode seven, right? Yeah, right. I thought, or, yeah, episode seven. I thought it took place after that. So I'm gonna have to read it. I, it yeah, it's basically the whole crux of the story is they're getting the generators for Hoth. Okay. That's the whole story. I, I don't know. It really bugged me. Like, the timeline really messed me up. Anyways. All right. Sorry. It's really good. It's, like I said, uh, Ted and Warren, it's basically, it's four issues, each of them introducing uh, one of the main characters um, from Star Wars, so Han Solo, Princess Leia, Luke, and Chewbacca, and then okay. they team up They team up with, like, a non-new character who they're kind of, the, like, recruiting into the Rebel Alliance. Wait, wait who are these guys? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that movie. I'm yeah. kidding. You got <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so real quick, uh, basically we're we're really sh- we're we gotta we gotta wrap this up real fast. So I just want to get your guys' opinion. What did you guys think of the two big reveals from Comic Con? Number one, the Wonder Woman costume. Ted, I dug it. I think that they went in the right direction. I still think that there are cosplayers out there that look look better as Wonder Woman, like the Thank one you. lady that did the Roman Wonder Woman costume, like just yeah. crushed. I mean that cos it's just a better costume. But yeah. they couldn't just steal her costume without. I mean that would have been rude. Uh, so I think that they, I think that they did fine. I think that it's, it reminds me of a little of the Thor costume in in the Marvel movies in a good way. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, Gal Gadot is kind of odd looking, but that's not a bad thing. Um, I think that's actually now that I think about it, it's actually kind of a cool thing that she's like <laughs> a, w- a little bit of a weird ethnic looking Wonder Woman. Like that's actually a better thing than like if she had just been like mega white chick, you know, with black hair, you know, like. Yeah. You know, uh, so that's cool. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, you know, the bat costume doesn't blow me away, but the but the Wonder Woman is kind of a nice nice surprise. Cool. Warren, what were your thoughts? Uh, well, uh, um, the Wonder Woman costume looked uh, looked a little bit Xena. It, it, yeah. It, oh yeah. Um, I think uh, I think would have liked it better if they would have kept more of the colors, maybe. I mean, they could be tarnished colors, if you will, but but at least like from the photographs that I saw, it just looked like brown red leather, and and it looked like Lucy Lawless. Uh, but, but but yeah, I mean, but skinnier, like not as well, yes, not as yes, mighty yes. looking as Lucy. Lucy is just so mighty. That's my whole issue with that movie. Yeah. I feel like it's lacking color. Like there's no color anywhere. And yeah. any of those those images we've seen, even the footage we saw, like I, we saw online, it, there's very little color there. I Colorist, think do you have a, do you have a word on that? <laughs> I'd like to see a bit more color. Yeah, I mean, I mean, these are superheroes after all, you know. So, you know. Well, like, you know, it worked for the X Men though to just like remove the color scheme from their costumes. Well, well, yeah, yeah, but but, but you're also but, setting them in a time period where just costumes aren't going to work. I, I think what the problem is when you when you take color out of Superman, you kill Superman. Like yeah. it's just not. He never smiles. <laughs> yeah. It's a huge issue. <laughs> Having fun, God, like he likes to be a superhero. Yeah, God forbid these superhero films be fun. You know. What's it's, the other? <laughs> what was the other re- re- big Comic Con reveal? Uh, I don't think there was really one. Will? Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. there's. It, it was all stuff we already knew. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's it. So, I mean, so Wonder, Wonder Woman. The Wonder Woman costume is the is the only talking point. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's, that's oh. the biggest reveal. We're, we're running we're running low on time, so we gotta we gotta get going. Okay. But I, like me and Warren were talking earlier, and I think I really think that studios, the Marvels and the DCs and their movie stuff. I really really think this is kind of that they're running away from Comic Con at this point. Um, I think we all expected huge announcements from both of those companies, and we got nothing. Like literally zero, zero nothing. Um, and I, I think that uh, Hall H is broken, and I think that they know it, and that just yeah. they know that this is not a good place to announce things because they're announcing it to these, to a horde of, of exhausted zombies, yeah. right? Um, you know, who are camping out there for four straight days, and 
You right. know, like it does. It just doesn't seem like the place to announce things anymore. The Hall H system is broken. It's been broken for years, and um, until they yep. can fix it, where like they are presenting stuff to a larger, fresher audience, yep. then there's no real point in announcing things in Hall H. Yeah, I completely uh, agree. And they they don't need to use Hall H anymore. I mean, Geekdom has become such a massive. Co uh, part of culture now that they don't have to market. They don't have to market to a select crowd. They can market to a mass audiences, and, and mass audiences will accept it. Um, so I, I wouldn't also call. Need... I'm s yeah, I'm sorry, I interrupted. I'm no, you're fine. I wouldn't call Hall H a select crowd anyway. It's just the kids that could actually yeah. get into it. You know, it's like right, the people right. that camped out all night just to get in. I'm not sure that that's the select crowd that they're trying to get. That's right. just the most hardcore nerdy. I have no life geeks that they can f that exist. You know, not that you know, not that I'm not essentially one of them. You know, <laughs> Will, uh, you went to Comic Con. Do you have anything you want to add? Um, here's how they should fix all H. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let, let's uh, let, let, let's do a lottery for tickets. Let's uh, do assigned seating and a special section for press, and boom, fix all H. <laughs> the tricky, uh, the tricky paper part paper. is it's shifting people in and out. Yeah. yeah. You know, they, they have at least so much time. time. They should do that they for have... each panel. Right. Well, right. what they're talking about doing is moving Hall H to the um, to the stadium across the street. Because okay. there's oh, a, wow. big, it's a big honking baseball stadium right yeah, across the street that seats yeah. 20,000 or yeah. more. You know, and they might as well put Hall H there. You know, it's like it's, you know, they're essentially, they're creating these big Rolling Stones concert-esque events, so they might as well, like, get a Rolling Stones venue and a Rolling Stones size audience. Yeah, agreed. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast this week. Like I said, we're huge fans of the of the Princess Ugg, and uh, I'm oh, becoming thank huge you so fans much. of yeah. Courtney. Yay. We love um, you. And I'll continue continue reading, and we'll continue talking about Princess Ugg on the podcast and, and singing her praises, and I'll continue sharing it with every person I know because I just think it's a fantastic product. And Thanks I, I love so, it so much. much. Yeah. So Ted, where can we uh, where can we find you? Please plug yourself and let us know where, where we, we can find your work. Um, you can f I mean Princess Ugg is all over the internet. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it on Comicsology, uh, more importantly, um, and you can uh, find it at any comic book shop because all the reputable comic book shops are carrying this book. So that's good. And you can find me at tednefe.com. That's nefe spelled N-A-I-F-E-H for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Warren, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me at my website. That's uh, warrenwissnish.com, but I know that is impossible to spell. Um, so, so just, I guess, Google Princess Ugg and then find me from there. <laughs> it's yeah. probably the best way. <laughs> me too. Actually, that's really smart. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, once again, thank you so much. And next time you guys have a book coming out or, or just want to come on and chat, please let me know. We'd love to have you back. Sounds awesome. good. Awesome. Thanks. Will, get us out of here. Awesome, as always, guys. Check us out on uh, www.geekswithwives.com. You can find us on Twitter at GWWCapesCrew. Uh, keep an eye out because I'll be doing some unboxing reviews on Comic-Con exclusives as well as some off-site stuff. And as always, you can catch me on Twitter at Darth Sparrow. And for the whole crew and our guests, we'd like to thank you, and we will catch you on the geek side.